swept aside the like so much sand. <laughs> so friends, I was uh, relaxing with my friend Edgar, learning some new spells and skills, and Boris comes. Yes, he waves me onward. He wants to go to this meeting, so I suppose I shall follow him. He's uh, in much more of a rush, I think, than I am to get there. But uh, he does have quite a long blade there. I think my fire blade should serve relatively well. I have been learning some new fire spells. Edgar did teach me <clears throat> quite a bit in the ways of destruction. For that I uh, am appreciative, although I still had to pay him some coin as would be expected. And we are now going to the sewers to get the fourth book. Hopefully no violence will come of it. Ah. Down he goes. You're so eager, Boris. Is there maybe time for a story before we get there? Perhaps not. There are mud crabs just up ahead. But I did learn a new trick. Like so. And down they go. Over here! It's over. Relax. This is the kill spell. It does drain my fatigue just a bit. But also oh, effective. I have given in to my my lust for magic, friends. Over here! But my friend Edgar says it's not uh, such a bad thing. Magic can be quite useful. Just have to make sure it does not completely overtake your mind or your focus. My focus will always be looting. I've done quite a bit of that in the city, trying to get back to uh, my roots, as it were. This is actually how I met Edgar. And coincidentally enough, how Boris found me. These naughty naughty rats. Tell you what. Edgar was also able to refresh all of my magical items, which I think is quite nice. Dead rat. Look out! Oh yeah, I got it. Don't worry, man. Are you are you, are you, are you okay? We, are we going forward now? Oh, he spotted something. Oh yeah, the water. Uh, I'm not so good with that. Do we really have to? Oh. Look at him just traipsing through. Like it's the easiest thing in the world. How far does it go? Oh. Oh. <sighs> okay. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. I hate it, but it's fine. Get out! Get out! Okay. <laughs> that is much better. Look at this fellow here. Hold one second, Boris. I want to have a look. Oh, he lives. Quite a powerful one. Oh, and down he goes. He took a couple more kill spells than I would have expected him to. I suppose I just wanted the uh, the combat experience. Oh my, goblins fighting crabs down here. Oh, and the crabs have won it seems. Well done, young mud crab. Let us avoid him. He is quite powerful. Please, please leave us. You mustn't come further. This is the way, Boris? Oh my. All the way straight down. Oh. 
Then we get this fellow. How about sneak attack? Look out! And finish with kill! Haha! -ha. Randar has become quite a force to be meddled with. Ah. Kill spells don't work, but if you open with uh, the sneak attack, I could also poison my arrows. I've done quite some uh, alchemical brewing as well. Oh, what is this? Mustn't pass this one by. Stick together. Oh my. Well done, Bars. <laughs> Swept aside, the like so much sand. Ah. More? I don't really want to go down in there, if you don't mind. I'll find my own way. Mudcrab! Oh, I missed him. You can get him, Bars. Well done. He did watch the flank. Alright, come on, come on. Get through it quickly, at least. <sighs> I'm going to need to dry my paws after this exploration. Endless exploration. I must make sure I don't lose bars, though. Where are you, friend? Yes, I'm here. There you are. You just want me to walk in the water with you, don't you? Look at the little mud crabs! That's so adorable! Oh, they do nothing. Nothing! I was going the right way, Boris, you know. <sighs> you just can't talk to some people. Alright, the room with the table is just through this door. I always wondered who put it there. I happen to know that if you go up the stairs there, you can get a vantage point on the meeting room. I think I'd better be the one to handle the meeting. You'll be my backup. Keep watch from above in case of trouble. Well, I guess that is a, a wise choice. I'll cover Good. you. Remember, we must not leave here without the book. It's our best chance of finding the amulet. Taking apart an entire Daedric cult does not seem like a task I am quite ready for. I ventured into oblivion, but who knows what the concentrated power of a cult could hold. Regardless, my friend, I am behind you. We must complete this task. Listen, I may not survive this, but if I don't, you must. You must recover the book and find the Amulet of Kings. Don't worry, my friend. I never fail. Then I'm lucky you're here to save my skin. Come on, let's do this. All right. Into the depths we go. Staircase. Staircase? Staircase. I told you to come alone. For Uriel, Uh-oh. I'm so sorry. I ruined that one nice and quick. Oh lord. Let's get that uh Oh my Dagon The time of Paradise awaits her. Oh my Mars, please be careful. Yeah! Time of cleansing! Just one more. Oh, I didn't mean to hit you, Bars. Please, allow me to do this. Oh, that was so close. more that won't be reporting back to their master. Well, do one of them uh, have the book? Oh, reflect damage. This is quite nice. Hailstone. The commentaries. Ha ha! I have the fourth and last volume of the Mysterium Xarxus. I can now piece together the clues within them to find the Mythic Dawn's secret shrine. Perhaps Tarmina can help. 
Indeed she shall. Perhaps all of these fellows have uh, some treats on them, hmm? Oh, just a little bit. The one was quite loaded down. Mmm, Ring of Sneak. I like this. Well, we made it, Boris. You want to uh, have a sit? Oh no, he's out of here. Well, friends, it didn't go quite as expected, but we were able to turn the tide. As per usual. I think now is a good time for a story. Something sufficiently creepy, I think. I hope you will enjoy. Allow me to tell you a terrifying tale of some thieving gone Ari. This look is interesting, said Indic, his eyes narrowing to observe the black caravan making its way to the spires of the secluded castle. A gaudy, alien coat of arms marked each carriage, the lacquer glistening in the light of the moons. Who do you suppose they are? They're obviously well off, smiled his partner Heria. Perhaps some new imperial cult dedicated to the acquisition of wealth? Go into town, find out what we can about the castle, said Indek. I'll see if I can learn anything about who these strangers are. We'll meet again on this hill tomorrow night. Herai had two great skills, picking locks and picking information. By the dusk of the following day, she returned to the hill. Indic joined her an hour later. This place is called Ol Alda Olria. Ald Olria, she explained. It dates back to the second era when a collection of nobles built it to protect themselves during one of the epidemics. They didn't want any of the diseased masses to get into their midst and spread the plague, so they built up quite a sophisticated security system for the time. Of course, it's mostly fallen into ruin, but I have a good idea about what kinds of locks and traps might still be operational. What'd you find out? I wasn't nearly so successful, frowned Indic. No one seemed to have any idea about the group, even that there were... Even that they were here. I was about to give up, but at the Charter House I met a monk who said that his masters were a hermetic group called the Order of St. Audna. I talked to him for some time, this fellow by the name of Paritheon, and it seems that we're, they're having a ritual feast tonight. Are they wealthy? asked Harai impatiently. Embarrassingly so, according to the fellow, but they're only at the castle for tonight. I have my picks on me, winked Harai. Opportunity has smiled on us. She drew a diagram of the castle in the dirt. The main hall and kitchen were near the front gate. The stables were secure, and secured armory were in the back. The thieves had a system that never failed. Harai would find a way into the castle and collect as much loot as possible, while Indic provided the distraction. He waited until his partner scaled the wall before rapping on the gate. Perhaps this time he would be a bard or a lost adventurer. The details were always the most fun to improvise. Harai heard Indic talking to a woman who came to the gate, but she was too far away to hear the words exchanged. He was evidently successful, because a moment later she heard the door shut. That man had charm. She'd had to give him that. Only a few of the traps and locks to the armory had been set. Undoubtedly, many of the keys had been lost in time. Whatever servants had been in charge of securing the old order's treasures had brought a few new locks to a fix. It took extra time to maneuver the intricate hasps and bolts of the new traps before proceeding to the old, but still working systems. But Haraya found her heart beating with anticipation. Whatever lie beyond the door she thought must be of su sufficient value to merit such protection. When at last the door finally swung open, the thief found her a vicious dreams paled to reality. The mountain of gold, treasure, ancient relics glimmering with untapped magicka, weaponry of matchless quality, gemstones the size of her fist, row after row of strange potions, and stacks of valuable documents and scrolls. She was so enthralled by the sight, she did not hear the man approach from behind her. You must be Lady Trased, said the voice, and she jumped. It was a monk in a black hooded robe, intric intricately woven with silver and gold threads. For a moment she could not speak. This was the sort of encounter that Indic loved, but she could think of nothing to do but nod her head with what she hoped looked like certainty. I I'm afraid I'm a little lost, she stammered. I can see that. <laughs> the man laughed. That's the armory. I'll show you the way to the dining hall. We were afraid you weren't going to arrive. The feast is nearly over. Haraya followed the monk across the courtyard to the double doors leading to the dining hall. A robe identical to the one he was wearing hung on a hook outside, and he handed it to her with a knowing smile. She slipped it on, 
She mimicked him as she lowered her, the hood over her head and entered the hall. Torches illuminated the figures within the large... Torches illuminated the figures within around a large table. Each wore the uniform black robe that covered all features, and from the look of things, the feast was nearly over. Empty plates, platters, and glasses filled every inch of the wood, with only the faintest spots and dribbles of the food remaining. It was a breaking of the fast, it seemed. For a moment, Haria stopped to think about the poor, lost Lady Trisset, who had missed her opportunity for gluttony. The only unusual item on the table was its centerpiece, a huge golden hourglass which was on its last minute's worth of sand. Though each person looked alike, some were sleeping, some were chatting merrily with one another, and one was playing a lute. Indic's lute, she noticed. And then she noticed Indic's ring was on the man's finger. Haria was suddenly grateful for the anonym anonymity of the hood. Perhaps Indic would not realize that it was she and that she had blundered. Trusset, said the man to the assembled, who all turned as one to her and burst into applause. The conscious members of the order arose to kiss her hand and introduce themselves. Nerdla, Sulek, Kyler, the names got stranger, Tonia, Hateliets, Nahatarap. She couldn't help but laugh. I understand. It's all backwards. Your real names are Aldrin, Celius, Relic, Ponma, Stylith, and Paratheon. Of course, said the young man. Won't you have a seat? Say, giggled Haraya, getting back into the spirit of the mask and taking an empty chair. I suppose that when the hourglass runs out, the names go back to normal? That's correct, Trisette, said the woman next to her. It's just one of our order's little amusements. This castle seemed like the appropriately ironic venue for our feast, devised as it was to shun the plague victims who were, in their own way, a walking dead. Haraya felt herself lightheaded from the odor of the torches and bumped into the sleeping man next to her. He fell face forward under the table. Poor S. Serif, said the neighboring man, helping to prop the body up. He's given us so much. Haraya stumbled to her feet and began walking uncertainly for the front gate. Where are you going, Trisette? asked one of the figures, his voice taking on an unpleasantly mocking quality. My name isn't Trisette, she mumbled, gri gripping Indic's arm. I'm sorry, partner, we need to go. The last crumb of sand fell into the hourglass as the man pulled back the hood. It was not Indic. It was not even human, but a stretch, gr stretch grotesquerie of a man, with hungry eyes and a wide mouth filled with tusk-like fangs. Haraya fell back into the chair of the figure they called Usek Teref. His hood fell open, revealing the pallid, bloodless face of Indic. As she began to scream, they fell upon her, and in her last living moment, Haraya finally spelled Trisette backwards. Horrifying friends. But I hope it did give you the right kind of chills. <laughs> ah, a fine victory it was. Hmm. Now I suppose we should go back to the Mages Guild. First, I want to have a look at what this book says. What drives people to such diluted madness? This one weighs nothing. Interesting. May the holder of the fourth key know the heart thereby. The Mundex Terrine was once ruled over solely by the tyrant Dro Kings, each to their own dominion, and border wars fought between their slave oceans. They were akin to the time totems of old yet evil and full of mockery and profane powers. No one live no one that lived did so outside the sufferance of the Dros. I give my soul to the Magna Gay, saith the joyous in paradise, for they created the Mayroon, created Mayroon's the Razor in secret, in the very bows of Lig, the domain of the upstart who vanishes. Though they came from diverse waters, each gets shared sole purpose. To Artifice, a prince of good, spinning his likeness in random swath, and imbuing it with Oblivion's most precious and scarce air set, asset, hope. Deathlessly I intone from paradise, Maroon's the thief-taker, Maroon's god's body, Maroon's the red, arms that went up, new mancha, liberty. Deny not that these days shall come again, my novitiates. For as Maroon's threw down Lig and cracked his face, declaring each of the nineteen and nine and nine oceans free, so shall he crack the serpent crown of Cyrodiil's and make the federation. 
All will change in these days as it was changed in those. For with, for with by the magic word Numancha, a great rebellion rose up and pulled down the arms of Kaim I, Garig, and the Templars of the Upstart were slaughtered, and their blood fell like dew from the upper wards down to the lowest pits, where the slaves with man maniacal faces bit their chains and teeth to their jailers, and all hope was brush fire. Your dawn listens, my lord. Let all the Orbis know itself to be free. May runes has come. There is no dominion save free will. Suns were riven as your red legions moved from Lig to the hinterlands of Chill. A legion for each get, and Curry was thrown down, and Jaff was thrown down, and Hormagai was crushed with cold salt, and forevermore called Hor. And so shall it be ag again under the time of Gates. Under the Myers, Malvioge was thrown down, that old city of chains slaked in new new bone warmth and set free. Galg and Morgalg were thrown down together in a single night of day, and shall it be again under the time of gates. Nothing but woe for Nern, which has become the pit, and seven curses on its row, the vermine nigh mocked. But for it the crusades would be as my lord's creation. Get by the gi and do as thou will of no fetters but your own conscience. Know that your hell is broken, people of the anu people of the Orbis. And praise the new mancha, which is liberty. <sighs> they speak of such liberty, but is there such liberty under a rule set this strict? I think not. Hmm. One, two, three, four. Goodbye, goodbye, see you again. Goodbye, goodbye, see you, my friends.